Well, let me thank you again. I know there's uh, many other places you could be. It always takes some effort to rearrange a day to make sure that you're here, and I really appreciate that. Not only do you minister to me because you're here, I mean, that's a little self-serving, but you really, you minister to each other because we encourage one another. So we are now approaching the very last message in the book of Romans. And oh, what a great study it's been. I've been encouraged. I hope I've been able to communicate some of that enthusiasm to you. But next week, we're going to have a little bit of a break. And uh, start saying Andy's going to preach. Sorry, Andy, didn't mean to put that scare into you. And Rusty is going to preach for us for the next two weeks. I've tried to give him words like an acrostic spelling the name Bruce. I'm sure he could think of a lot of positive terms, but I think he's probably got his own ideas, and they're probably going to come from the Scriptures, don't you bet? So I know he's been working on a theme, and we look forward to that. I see... Larry is here. Larry, did you bring my Bible? Oh, good, good. I, Michael and I went off to, over to see Larry and Gloria, and I asked her, I said, now what kind of a word should I give to people? Because people want to encourage her, and I think we found the perfect formula. She said that if you would call, and, and if it works, she would love to have company in the afternoon and in the evening, uh, you know, when it's appropriate. And she would be honest, she said, and let people know when they called. And, and what we found was the three of us sat there for a couple of hours and made fun of Larry. And I mean, we all walked away encouraged. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We, and we did get to see the pheasants. That was fun, too. Our message today is Paul's final words to the church in Rome. Well, that's not a very glamorous title. And the message is one that we, we have to look through a lot of verses and kind of find a, a few key ideas that he mentions as he concludes his letter. Now, there's a lot that we could do in regards to who these people are. He lists a, really quite a lengthy uh, list of names. But I'd like to just find five ideas that I think would kind of summarize what we find in these final verses. You'll notice that I have all of the verses printed there. Of course, you'll be able to read those as we go along. But for the sake of the message, I have some in a larger font and a bolder print, and they'll bring to us the main idea. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and just start off. He's saying, you know, I, I intend to come. I'm looking forward to it. But in the meanwhile, these are my final words. And let's look at number one and fill in that blank. Give generously. Let's take a look at the verses right under that. Give generously. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, 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 I practice on that, and now I forget how it goes. We're going to call it Achaia. All right, we'll do that have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them, since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem. They feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. Now that was a big deal because Paul later on says, I'm not sure they'll even take the gift. The situation with the Romans and the, the Jews they had some tension. Paul writes of that. We've looked at some of those verses. But overall, there becomes this, this dividing in the church. Those who are Jewish in their background and those who are Gentile. And though they are one family, there's kind of been a, a, a rift in that fellowship. So Paul says, it is so good of you to give. And you've given generously. And I'm going to take that gift and I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and seek to bless those people. May I say to you that Beth and I have received many, many gifts through the years. When we were on our way to Brazil and we were a young family and three little children, and if my kids wanted to do what we, would, what we did, I would call them irresponsible. I don't know if it was a matter of faith or ignorance, but either way, God blessed it. 
And many of you, quite honestly, over the years, have been very generous in meeting our needs during that phase of ministry. <clears throat> We're in a different stage of life now. And can I tell you that I understand now why you have been so gracious in your giving? Because it really is better to give than to receive, isn't it? And I think Paul would want to emphasize that point right here. He would say, listen, I want you to remember this. No matter what your circumstances are, you need to give generously. I was just sharing yesterday in a conversation that many years ago, there was an occasion where a pair of pants, and I hope none of you worked there, all right? I don't remember if it was Penny or Sears, but there was a pair of pants in the wrong place under the wrong price, and I took it up, and they said, oh, no, that, that's not the right price. Or maybe it was marked. I don't remember all the details. Quite honestly, all I remember is <clears throat> I made a real jerk of myself. That's what I remember demanding that I see the manager and wanting to make sure that, I mean, it was very important for the welfare of the world <clears throat> that I set this matter right. And I can remember then thinking, I probably went overboard. And later on, no, I f was certain that I was really a jerk. You know what's funny is I do not remember at all how much I saved on those pants. But I have remembered all these years that I was really a jerk. That it would not have hurt me then to be generous in my spirit. To be even generous in my money. Because it is true. Even if you don't have much, it is a blessing when God uses you to, the, to meet the needs of somebody else. Now, there are a lot of needs out there. There are too many. None of us can help everybody. But there are times when God will bring someone into your life and you'll be able to share your resources with them. And indeed, you will find it's true time and time and time again, even when people take advantage of you, that it is better to give than to receive. So I think the first thing that Paul might mention to us if he was going through his own letter is this. Hey, make sure that you live by this simple principle. Give generously. Number two, pray earnestly. <clears throat> pray earnestly. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are now alive again. All right. May I say to you that as the pastor of this church, I need for you to pray for me. Do you know what my greatest fear is? My greatest fear is, and I have no plans, all right? I don't want to tell you, oh, I've been this close, because I don't know if I have been or not. That's part of the, the pride and the stupidity that we have. But my greatest fear is this, that after investing over 15 years in this place, working side by side with you, that I would do something stupid and to hurt the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ, my family, and this church. Because all of us know that there is an enemy out there, and he prowls around seeking whom he may devour. That there is protection when you're walking in obedience. But all you have to do is tell the Lord, I think my way is a better way. And you walk for a little while in that arrogance, in that rebellion, in that disobedience. And that fast, your life can be changed. It can be ruined from another person's perspective. Now we know that God is faithful and he puts back the pieces. But Paul said, listen, I want you to earnestly pray for me because I am in a battle and I want you to struggle with me. <clears throat> so a quick little piece of advice that I share with you again and again and now one more time is this. When you go down through our prayer list, when you begin praying for the people in your family, 
Just use your five fingers and say, Lord, bless them in this area. Father, help them in this area. Father, do this for them. Five things so that when you finish, it won't be the five same things every day when you pray for that individual or when you pray for that situation. But what you're doing is you're praying a real prayer and not just God bless them, God bless everybody in the whole world. Because if there's one thing all of us need is we need our loved ones. We need those people who really care about us. We need to know that they are praying for us. I've heard the testimony time and time and time again when someone has said, I could feel the presence of those prayers. I, I knew people were praying for me because I went through this incredibly dark hour and I felt the presence of the Lord. Paul said, listen, give generously, pray earnestly. Number three, speak kindly. <clears throat> speak kindly. Now, this is quite a lengthy list. We're just going to read the bold print, but look at some of the kind things that he says. One who is worthy of honor. She has been helpful to many. They once risked their lives for me. Ha uh, who has worked so hard for your benefit. They are highly respected. Our co-worker in Christ, my dear friend, a good man whom God approves, who has worked so hard for the Lord, who has been a mother to me. Paul goes down through this long list of people who are in Rome and he speaks to them person by person, line by line, and he says all these very generous things. I think there's a good principle there that's, that's good for all of us. Speak kindly. <clears throat> the older we get, sometimes the, the, the less effective the filter is. And the older we get, we feel like we have the right to just say whatever we're thinking, say whatever we're feeling, and we just knock down people, we blast people, we cut them. I think Paul, and he had a strong personality, I think Paul would say, no, no, when I go to bed at night and I review the day, this is one thing I wish I would have done, and I wish I would have been more kind. I wish it would have been kinder to the people who were against me, the people who were working with me, to speak kindly. I am so excited to work with the Cast and Christian Club at the junior high level. It's a great group of young people. We have about 20 or so, maybe a little more than that. Every week they get together. This week we started a new project. I passed out a number to all of them and then somebody pulled out a number and then that person stood up and gave their name and then everybody else in the group had an opportunity to write an encouraging word to that person. I think maybe we only covered about five of the kids. We'll finish the rest of them in the weeks to come. But one girl left with a little stack of, of notes and I said, well, good, you got some notes. And she turned and smiled and said, this has made my whole day. Just to read some kindness. Just to hear someone say, I see this quality in you. I see these characteristics. I saw you do this good deed. Christian, we speak the truth. I would never encourage you to do anything but that. But the warning is this, speak the truth in love. Speak kindly. Give generously, pray earnestly, speak kindly. Number four, stand firmly. Stand firmly. Starting at uh, verse 17 in the last chapter of the book of Romans, Paul writes this. And now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. 
Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. But everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. This makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and to stay innocent in any wrong. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Oh, what what's some, are some really great words there that Paul gives? And he starts off by saying, listen, don't believe everybody you hear. Now, the reason everybody needs to be a part of a church, a church that believes that the Bible is the word of God, a church that believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, the reason we need to be a part of a church like that is because we need a filter. There is so much out there, especially in our day on the TV and on radio. We need a filter. This is the place, the primary place, that we come to learn and study the Word of God. Paul says you make sure that you guard the truth. Don't allow anyone in. Don't give them access to the people, the pulpit, if you don't trust that what they say is going to come from the Word of God. When we have missionaries come in, they come in because we have vetted them. We have looked at their doctrinal statement. We say we not, may not agree with everything they say on every issue, but we have confidence that this man or this woman believes in the integrity of the Scripture. They have complete confidence in the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we recommend to you that you hear what they preach, what they teach. I mentioned to you that next week, Rusty is going to be preaching for the next two Sundays. Looking forward to that. In part because we know, we know the schooling that he's done. We know the work that he's done. We know the integrity that he's demonstrated in his business and in his family. And he will come and not tell us stories Unfortunately, he won't tell you anything good about me because his job will be to preach the word of God. When Daniel is up here, he does, he's, he's not up here for a therapy class. He's here, he, he is here to lead us in an understanding of how blessed we are to be in the presence of God himself Paul says you make sure that nobody comes in and destroys the foundation, the good that is happening in your church. Watch out. There are people out there and you can't trust them. 99% of what they say might seem to be good, but there's enough error in there that they are dangerous. So stand firmly. Notice what it said right here. But everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. This makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and to stay innocent of any wrong. Isn't that a great prayer for every parent? We are blessed. I know you feel the same way when you look at your children and your grandchildren. And those of us who have a, a, a determination to serve the Lord, we would say this, there's no greater joy than seeing our children walk in obedience to the word of God. To live in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. It is true that all of us are hypocrites. There's no doubt about that. Am I ever as spiritual during the week as I am standing behind the pulpit? Probably not. I probably look a lot better than I am, and, and no doubt I might even suggest that. I, I might like that attention. I try not to be that way, but, you know, there's always that possibility. Look at me. Look at me. I'm spiritual. What about you? Are you spiritual? I hope you never get that sense. 
But there's a certain part of us that we always think we're a little better than we really are, and thus there are people out there who will say, see, even the preacher's a hypocrite. I sat behind him there. I heard him do this. I watched him do that. He's not as good as he thinks he is, and they would be exactly right. I'm not as good as I think I am. But what a testimony it is for any of us. Even though we fall down, even though we fail, that people can look at our lives and they can see the direction in which we're going. They can see the determination in which we are seeking to go in that direction. And they can say, you know what? They're not perfect, but I know this. They are struggling. They are doing everything in their power. They are trusting in the Lord to do what is right and to stay away from what is wrong. And that is a testimony the world cannot deny. Because in doing that, we're not doing it to make us feel better. We're not doing it so that we would feel happy. We're doing it to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we please him, we find out in a way that we don't even understand how it can be true. That even if I am sacrificing, and even if I am denying myself, there is a joy that comes from being obedient. A joy that the world can't really appreciate. A joy that they really cannot understand. But may I just say it? It feels good to do the right thing. And it doesn't feel good right away, but over time, you know, it feels good to do the right thing. And here Paul is saying, I want everyone, but everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. This makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and to stay innocent of any wrong. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So stand firmly. Stand on the truth. Our final point is very much related to that because he keeps going on with that theme and he says, walk obediently. Walk obediently. One of the words used in a number of places in the New Testament is the word for unruly. As a church, we're to discipline those who are unruly. And the picture of that is really a neat word picture. And now that I've had a couple of boys in the military, and those of you that have had children in the military, you'll hear them talk about they spend hours marching. And I mean, they're right close to each other. And if somebody missteps, it affects everybody. And you've seen some of the cartoons and some of the movies where when one person stops and the rest of the people run into them and they just do that. Maybe you've seen the video. It's been over on the Internet all, oh, all fall. And it's the little football team. And the mothers are up there and they're holding the sign and the little football team is supposed to run through the sign and break it. Have you seen that one? Well, it is just a hoot. It's really a hoot. The little boy with his helmet on, he hits the sign and the sign stops him. And I mean, it's that chain reaction. They just bump into each other and pretty soon there's a pile of kids on the ground and the mothers are still holding the sign taut so that, well, anyway, that is unruly. That's what happens. If you get out of line when you're marching, all of a sudden the people behind you are pounding into one another. This is the idea that the Bible uses so often with walking in obedience. Walking and marching and keeping in step with the commander. When he says left, you go left. When he says right, you go right. Step by step, never faster, never slower. Walking in perfect harmony with the authority's voice. That's the picture that Paul gives to us. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to march in your Christian life. I want you to march in such a way you're a blessing to the person to the right. And you're a blessing to the person on the left. You're a blessing to the person in front and behind. Because everybody is walking in obedience to the voice of the authority. Here's what he says. Now all glory to God, who is able to make you strong 
Just as my good news says, notice he takes claim of the gospel. Just as my good news says, this message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles. A plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now as the prophets foretold and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all generations everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So the message is this. Give generously. Pray earnestly. Speak kindly. Stand firmly and walk obediently. I've saved a portion of the message to do what I don't normally do. You have been very faithful coming through, uh, oh, for a number of weeks and months now, walking chapter by chapter through this great book. By some estimations, the most important book in all of the New Testaments after the Gospels. Because it tells us everything we need to know to be successful in our Christian experience. But there's a time when all of us need to reflect just a little bit. When there needs to be a challenge given, not from the preacher, not from the pulpit, but from the Word of God. When I look through my notes, and these are all the notes from the book of Romans that we have studied, when I read through all of these and I flip back and review them, I think to myself, whoa, what have I done? Because I have studied the book of Romans, look what I am committed to. Look at what I'm obligated to put into the practice of my life. Oh, I've already been as honest as I'm going to be. I'm not sharing any more of my secrets with you, all right? But like you, there are ups and there are downs. There are times when I think, oh man, it is great to be a Christian. And then there are other times when I think, I cannot believe I just fell for that same stupid line that the enemy gives time and time again. But as I mentioned before, it's really important for us to say, I am doing as much as I know the Lord is asking me to do right now. So that's the question. Perhaps through this study in the book of Romans, you've been dealing with an issue. What do I do? Do I surrender? Do I give in? Do I make this change? Do I sacrifice this, whatever this might be? And it is, yes, you must. Paul says, yes, you must. Because what really matters is that other people know the Lord Jesus Christ. That God receives glory because of the way you're living your life. Change is a word that is in the believer's vocabulary. We should be changing all of the time. And is change easy? No. Let me read that final paragraph that Paul gives us again as we conclude. Now all glory to God, who is able to make you strong, just as my good news says. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. And now as the prophets foretold and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. Speaking of Christ, all glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? Let me just ask. You don't need to respond. You don't need to raise your hand or, or look at me. Just, just think. We have talked of the gospel over and over, and we'll continue to do that because it is the very heartbeat of the Bible. 
But for, perhaps there have been a few here, perhaps more than we would even begin to guess, who have been debating back and forth, am I really a Christian? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Well, I think I am, but then there are other times you're not sure you are. May I suggest to you that this is the day to be certain. That this is the day when you mark it down, perhaps in the very front of your Bible, on this day at 1130, I made my decision clear. I made it obvious to you, Lord. I made it obvious to the enemy who loves to confuse me. I am repenting of all my sin, and I am believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know that no one else can take away my sin. No one else can give me the promise of eternal life. So if you have not done that, today is the day of salvation. That this is the day you can be certain. And then Christians, really, for all of us. But is the Lord pressing on something? Oh, it keeps coming up in your thinking. You know, you ought to get rid of that. You know, it's about time you dealt with that sin. You know, that's an attitude. That's something you need to go apologize for. If there is something that keeps bubbling to the top time and time again, then why don't you just assume that the Spirit of God is working in your heart and take that matter before the Lord and say, Lord, I surrender. I want to do what's right. I want to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a channel of the gospel. Father, I surrender all. Christie's song could not have been any more perfect for a day like today. I surrender all. All to you I freely give. Father, it is such a pleasure to read and to study the books of the Bible. Father, there's a certain satisfaction that comes when we get to the end of a study. It gives us an opportunity to look back and reflect on what we've been challenged with. Father, I'm asking that indeed you would do that. Lord, that you'd bring to us not only the knowledge that we've gained, but Lord, also the determination. Remind us of where we were when we studied this and the decisions we made. And Lord, that we might be faithful in walking in obedience. Because we know that's the whole theme of this book. Is that we might understand your plan well enough to surrender to it. That we might be empowered by your Holy Spirit to accomplish your will. And Father, that we'd live in such a way that our love for the Lord Jesus would intensify and grow every single day. Father, we want to be better prepared to share this good news with our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our fellow students. Father, I'm asking that you would do that in my life. Lord, I know that there are many here who are praying in that same humble way. Lord, that you would do a great work in their lives. And Father, we pray this with full confidence because we know that your standard is not a certain amount of knowledge. It's not a certain amount of spirituality. But you bless the humble. You lift up the broken. You are pleased with humility. Father, we know that. That's why we come praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being on this journey with us. I trust you'll be back next week. I know Rusty has been working and has a great two-part series that he'd like to share with you. God bless you.